So tell me, Marie, what do you think you would be when you grow up? Um, I wanted to be a teacher, and I also wanted to be a nurse, and happily I got to do both of those things. Um, I think I wanted to be a nurse because um, as I was growing up, um, my dad was in and out of the hospital many times for heart problems, and many nights I was, I was woken up by flashing red lights from an aid car. Um, I think that was a defining moment for me when I really decided that I wanted to be a nurse because I wanted to be able to help people like my dad. Um, when we were kids, uh, I we played school after school. I know, unusual. And I got to be the teacher a lot of that time. And I think my love of helping others um, led me to get my teaching degree. So I got to do both of those things. What are your favorite memories from when you were a kid? Um, two of my favorite memories. Um, one was um, we lived in Green Lake, which was a really nice place to grow up. It was a little lake just half a block from where I lived. And we would leave in the morning and take snacks. And we would go down to the lake and we would lay in the sun all day. We would play frisbee. We would ride bikes. We would go swimming. Um, we would chase each other around. There was no parental guidance. Um, we went home when we got hung hungry for dinner most of the times. Um, and it was just a really great place to grow up. It was a different kind of growing up than we have today. Most definitely. I mean, <laughs> there's this thing that they that I've seen before. It's like we drank out of the hose. We didn't wear bike helmets. <laughs> we, I mean, we stayed out all day. You stayed outside all day because that's what you did. We didn't have phones. We didn't have computers. We didn't have any of that. Tell me about somebody who inspired you when you were growing up? I think one of the persons that inspired me a lot was my third grade teacher. She was a really big influence on me. She was kind and loving and funny and smart. And she made us feel special. She made us feel like, like we were the best students ever. Um, I, I remember that we actually got to go to her house and spend the night. Um, the two times I remember, there was two other girls that were with me. and. You know, obviously nowadays that would never happen, but she brought us into her personal life, which was totally different. I can remember her house, and I can remember meeting her husband, and I think that's, that's when I decided that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, what does educational opportunity mean to you? What do those words mean? That's a good question. I think that educa educational opportunity means that everybody should have easy access to and an opportunity for a good, equal education, no matter where they live or where they come from. That's what it means to me. Walk me through what it was like for you when desegregation came to Seattle. You weren't bust, but students were bust into your classes, into your school. Yeah. What I, was that like? I, I felt like I was lucky. I wasn't one of the kids that got bust. Um, but many of my friends did, um, and that was hard for them. It was also hard for us. We, you know, people that we'd grown up with and gone to elementary school with, and all of a sudden we weren't going to school with them. Um, and we weren't used to dealing with kids from different cultures or from a different part of the city or different colors for that matter. And they weren't used to being with us either. So it, it was not pretty in the beginning. Um, parents in the North End where I lived were not happy about it. And I assume that it was the same for the South End schools. There was protests, there was meetings, there was political in intervention, and it was a real mess. It really was. And we had no idea what to expect wasn't really talked about that I can remember. Um, so yeah, it was it was a big adjustment period. The first year was really awful. May I ask, why did you feel lucky? Because I got to stay at my neighborhood school. I didn't have to get on a bus and go for an hour and a half to an, another school where I didn't know anybody, not the teachers and not the kids. So I felt fortunate. At, at the time, all I knew was I didn't have to get on a bus. W can you share some times when you felt you were successful 
in school in those years? You know, I always felt um, successful and included when I was a kid. I was a really good student. It, school was easy for me. Um, the, I, I excelled in pretty much everything except math. I had a hard time with math. Um, and yeah, I never felt not included. I was friends with uh, all different kinds of kids, different groups throughout the years. Um, and I was friendly and outgoing and, and got along well. So I think that helped to, to make me feel um, included and not excluded. And yet you've said there were times when it was very, very hard. What were some of the less successful experiences you had? Um, I definitely felt unsafe in my middle school years um, during the busing, but it, it did get better with time. Um, I think we just got used to being together in school. Um, some of the not so pleasant things I can remember is um, I, I got beat up once and my coat got stolen. And it wasn't even by a girl that I knew. Um, but there was racial tension for sure. And the, the black girls didn't want white girls dating the black boys. And when that happened, it was awful. That's a lot of what the, the bullying was. Um, kids didn't get to, it didn't happen to me, but other kids that were coming into the school couldn't do after school activities because there was no bus to take them. And the same with the kids that were bused from the north end down to the south end. And that's such a huge part of who you are when you're a little kid. That extra stuff is really important. It teaches you lots of skills that you can, that you can learn. And so, you know, that was a really sad part of it. I think that the teachers and the administration tried to help us get adjusted, but they clearly didn't know and were not prepared for it either. Was there any person who you felt at the time you could go to to help you through some of the adjustments? I think Mr. Smith. Um, I just remember him being really caring and, and trying to make sure that in his classroom everybody felt included and, you know, making sure that, you know, he didn't treat different kids differently, that he treated everybody the same. And I just remember feeling safe and, and included in his class, for sure. What about your folks? How much of this <laughs> were they aware of? How much were you able to talk to them about what was going on? I don't think they had any idea. And because I wasn't bust, I think that they probably thought that it wasn't going to affect me much, but, but that wasn't true. And I honestly, I don't remember them talking to me about it. Um, but I did feel feel unsafe, and I think probably as a little kid, I just didn't know how to express that. There were there were days when I came home crying from school for sure, and there were days that I didn't want to go, and that was completely foreign to me because I always loved school. Yeah. Um, I when I was really little, before I was even in kindergarten. My mom was working at the school in the lunchroom, and she would take me to the school, and she would set me on the stage, and I would sit there, and kids would come up and talk to me, and I would watch her clean up the, lunch the lunchroom. So I was even in school before I was even in school. And for the most part, it was, it was a positive experience in school. So when it wasn't a positive experience, that was like that shocking was serious. to me yeah. and n not expected at all. What? Do you think that the experience in middle school, the experience of desegregation along those particular lines had a lasting effect on you in any way? Yes, I think it did. What did you learn from it? I think that it gave me um, something that I hadn't had, which is an appreciation for people from that were not like me and that were from other, other cultures and other backgrounds. Um, I think it also taught me that it, it can get better that it won't always be like it was in the beginning because we got used to each other after being together for th three years. And um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what do you think people do know or should know about that particular experience, the experience of desegregation along those lines? Um, 
it was pretty overwhelming. Um, like I said, quite a few of my friends were bused away or moved to private schools um, if they could afford it. Um, I struggled to make friends with all the new kids um, because they weren't very friendly in the beginning. And I understand that now. I didn't understand that when I was a kid. Um, it, it was all really confusing. Um, but I also, f I think, learned that I could go through some difficult times and still come out on the other side and not be changed by it in a negative way. So it built strength for you. Yeah, I think it did. And I would never have thought that. I, obviously, Certainly at the time. Right. Obviously, as an adult, I can look back and, and see those things um, as far as my memory looks. <laughs> if, if you had to say to your teachers, your parents, the parents of your friends back in the day about this experience or about what they could have done differently, what would you suggest? Um, I, I recently read an article about um, the desegregation and the effects of the busing program. And it said in the article, this was from the Historical Society of Seattle, it said as a plan, it had good intentions, but it failed miserably. And I think that sums it up completely. Um, they should make all schools and funding for schools the same for all students. Uh, public schools are more diverse now, but in my elementary school, um, there was one Asian student and the rest of us were white and we came from a very white neighborhood. Um, I think they, they needed to come up with a better plan. I think their intentions were good mm -hmm. and I think there needed to be something done about it but I just think that they should have tried to do it a different way and I don't know what that would look like I, I don't know how we could do it differently other than making schools equal in the first place even today if you go to the east side the schools in the east side of, of Seattle and Bellevue area are better funded they have better programs they yes. have better books they have better everything if you go to a school in the central district it's not the same, that's even today, many, many years later. That's very true. So I think that um, while it's a great concept, it's quite difficult to achieve it. I think that more schools are more integrated now, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do. And you've been teaching. Tell us a little bit about your experience as a teacher and perhaps how some of this experience has informed your work? Hmm. That's a long question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think that um, as a teacher, I taught all kinds of kids. Um, I taught little kids. I taught grown-ups. I taught English. I taught Spanish. Um, I taught two kids. And this was before they did online teaching. This was years ago. I taught online to students in Asia. I taught mm -hmm. them English mm -hmm. in the middle of the night <laughs> because of the time difference. It wasn't their middle of the night. No, it, was it wasn't. Yours. And I can remember when I finished teaching that I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, but I didn't want to get up early. So this is a way to solve that. <laughs> didn't have to get up early. I just had to stay up all night. <laughs> but I think that, you know, based on my and my background and things that I went through that I was able to do that, those things, and teach kids from other cultures and, and not only teach them English, but teach them a little bit about what happens in countries that are not the same as theirs. Um, and also really interesting that most of the places that I taught, um, English was their second language, but they did learn it in school. So they used their main language um, their first language, and then they also learned English. Um, and I learned a second language, and that was also gave me really insight into how difficult it is to learn a second language. And it's especially difficult to learn English because there's so many grammar rules that are exceptions, and so many words that sound alike, but they're spelled different, or words that are spelled the same, but they sound different. Um, and having done that, I think it gave me a, 
more of an appreciation for what it's like to learn something. Um, and I also taught kids that were um, either behaviorally, behaviorally challenged or educationally, um, academically. And that was super, super rewarding. Um, one of the memories that I have is I worked at a place where we worked with kids and adults that were having um, problems with executive function, mm -hmm. organizing things, um, staying on task and be able to follow what was happening in the classroom. And I think that's one of the most rewarding positions that I had. Here we have these kids that are marginalized. They don't feel like they are included. They don't feel like they fit in anywhere. Um, and they come to us as a last resort. They, a lot of the parents had tried everything to help these kids because they want their kids to be successful and they struggle with how much their kids were struggling um, and so it felt really good to give these kids the strategies that they could use to go to a regular school and at least be more on an even playing field with the neurotypical kids or adults um, One one memory of that was um, he was a little boy. Um, I think he was maybe 11. Adorable. One of my favorite students. We would end up talking and laughing half the time he was there, um, which was fine. It was socialization. Um, but as I was teaching him, his parents um, told me that he was telling them he didn't feel like he was in the right body. So um, born as a boy, but started identifying as a girl. And they said, you know, he, he doesn't share this with everybody. Um, so, you know, they might not share it with you, but we wanted to let you know. And um, he came in one day and we were talking, how was school today? What happened? And, and uh, he said, you know, I have a really hard time in my school. And I said, well, why? And he goes, well, because I look like a boy, but I don't feel like a boy. I was like, you know what? You can be whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. I'll call you whatever you want me to. We can talk about whatever you want me to. I'm not going to make judgments about who you are or who you want to be. And I, um, and and he was fine with that. And then I know that he felt more comfortable with me, and that if he wanted to come in and talk about shoes and dresses, that that was fine, and and we would do that, and we did. Um, and his parents let me know shortly thereafter when I told them what had happened is that they were really surprised because he had never talked about that to anybody but his parents, not even people at school. And so I just felt like, oh, this is such an honor to be able to yes. be involved in this kid's life as much as I was and that, you know, that, that they shared this with me. It was really private and personal. Um, so that made me feel like I was successful. You were trusted. And, and yeah, you were trusted. absolutely. He, there's no way he would be able to talk about that to his friends at school. No. So I worked with him for quite a while and ultimately met with his teacher. They were not supportive of this child at all. Not in any way, shape, or oh, form. Goodness. And I finally told his mom, I said, you know what? I bet there's a school out there that's right for him, but the yeah. school isn't right. And they came to the same conclusion, as did my boss. And so um, they moved him to a different school. He started dressing like a girl, growing his hair long, which he already had pretty long hair. And I actually ran into him a few years later. I was at a mall, and um, he came walking by, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's him or her. Or her. <laughs> and uh, she came over, and I said, are you still going by Zach? And she said, yeah. And I said, how do you like your new school? And he's like, oh, it's just wonderful. There's other kids like me that are there. Wow. And I don't get in trouble from the teachers, and wow. my parents are happy. And I said, that's really great. I'm so glad that you're doing so well. Don't go to Florida. No. <laughs> don't go to Texas. There's a lot of places that you, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to go these days. But um, as difficult as it is for kids that are transitioning, I think that it's getting to a point where it's a little bit easier, I hope. Um, from what I've seen, I think that's true. Do you think, or have you thought, prior to having this experience of talking for StoryCorps, have you thought how your experience as a 6th, 7th, and 8th grader might have informed your capacity to empathize, to understand what this 
young child was going through. Absolutely. I think that, um, I think I've always been empathetic, not sympathetic. Sympathy is something that you can give to somebody that you don't really know what they're going through, but you feel bad about it. Empathy is actually knowing what it's like or being able to look at it from the other person's point of view. And mm -hmm. I've always had that. And I think that, um, you know, going through middle school and then and then on all s in high school, like we started to get along, but there was an influx of kids from Vietnam. So there was a whole other oh. group and culture um, that we had to get used to. Can you share a little bit about that? Um, <laughs> there were a lot of food fights in the lunchroom. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was a much bigger school, um, much more different kids. Were you at Lincoln? I was at Lincoln, yeah, in Seattle. Um, and um, actually my mom, my brothers went there too. Um, I think that it gave me an opportunity to try things that I wouldn't necessarily try. It gave me the ability to pick up my life, store all my things in my mother's basement and move to a foreign country. I moved to Mexico. Yes, you did. And I lived there in three different cities for about seven years, I think, altogether. Um, so I took my new Spanish that I had been learning but not really practicing and, and and went there. And I think that if I hadn't experienced kids from different cultures um, and and been open to the, um, how that um, affected me, I wouldn't have done those things. I would have just stayed in Seattle, probably got married. don't think I would have had kids, but um, I don't think I would have done that. And it's really interesting when I tell people some of the things that I've done in my life. I've traveled a lot and done a lot of different things. They're like, wow, you've done a lot of different things. I don't think I could ever do that. And I'm like, you could. You just have to make the decision that that's what you're going to do, and you got to take a leap of faith because there's no other way to do it. So I think that some of those things um, that happened to me in, in my younger years, but also in high school, um, sort of gave me a, um, an opportunity. I saw an opportunity, I think, that I wouldn't necessarily have seen before. I'm going to ask a question that's not part of this at all. Okay. But your brother was in Vietnam. Yes, he was. As a medic for a year. Did your meeting Vietnamese kids who came over on the boats, how did that intersect in your mind with what Gino's experience, if you knew at all about Gino's experience? I, I knew some. What I remember is he. W we would send tapes back and forth. So we would make these mm -hmm. tapes and send to him talking about what was happening and how much we missed him. And then he would send them back. And I remember, I don't remember the content, but I remember that we, when we were so excited when we got those tapes, and we would all sit down as a family and listen to him. I also remember that he was trying to do things for the kids there. That's mm -hmm. really who he focused on. And they just didn't even have the simplest things like soap to take a bath. Yes. So he told us that. We got together. We went to all kinds of different places, mostly hotels that were not going to use their little soaps. And we collected them all, and we sent the soap there. And I can remember a picture of him mm -hmm. with a child with a bowl or a pan of water and soap, and he was teaching the child how to wash how to himself. soap. And yes. I can remember that so well. Yes. I don't think I made the connection between – he was in Vietnam helping his kids, and then the kids came from Vietnam. Okay. I remember seeing the planes and of them loading people on people that were desperate to get out of Vietnam. I do remember seeing that. Yes. And I remember seeing it on the TV, on the news, yes. which that had never happened before. So I don't think I necessarily made the connection between mm -hmm. what he was doing um, and what, what I experienced uh, when I was in high school. And you know what? He didn't talk about it very much. No. He, no. to this day, doesn't talk about it very much. I think if you ask him a specific question, yes. if he could remember, he would answer yes. it. But I think it, I mean, he was a, a medic. He saw the worst of the worst. Yes, he did. And I think that I know it affected him because I know when he came home from Vietnam, he wanted nothing to do with 
politics or the government. He grew his hair long. He was a hippie. <laughs> and he was um, a, one of the four founding fathers of some amazing things here. There was a, a clinic um, up on Capitol Hill that was called the Country Doctor, and he was one of the people that started it. Um, and it was did really well for a long time. People in the neighborhood had some place to go to get their care that they could afford. Um, let's go back to the questions. Okay. There you go. What do you think your legacy can be? Mm, I like this question. Um, I think that the legacy I want to have is my teaching. I, w I want to feel like I was able to give back to my community and make a real difference in kids' lives. And I want to be the teacher that kids remember. I want to be that special teacher that somebody goes, I remember that teacher and they made me feel good about myself or they made me feel included. That's who I want to be. That's the legacy that I want to leave. And do you have any questions for me? <laughs> well, you weren't That's around. Just the very last. I one. know. I see that. Well, you weren't around when any of this, this was is true. happening. This um, is true. I remember very well the day you got married to my brother. Oh. <laughs> and how exciting it was! We got to go to California. We were in a beautiful place. I got to be in the wedding. Um, That's right. There was a lot of people that I knew, their family and and friends. Um, and I just remember thinking how beautiful you were and how lucky I was. And as the years went by, I really did feel like you were the sister that I didn't get. I got three brothers instead, who I loved dearly, but yes. they were not. <laughs> they, they were, were not. definitely not your sister. No, they were not. <laughs> um, and, and over the years, um, I feel like you have supported me in so many ways. I got oh, to live with you for a while, and you've true. given me advice and helped me get through things that have been really difficult. Um, what did you think of me when you met me? <laughs> I met you when I met your parents for the first time, oh. when Gino and I were still courting. Yes. And uh, you were a classic daughter in the <laughs> sense of... The, the traditional tensions that exist between moms and daughters. And I was very aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> and how old was I? I have no idea. This would I have been 1978. Okay. I was born in 59. Okay. So you were 20. I don't remember that. <laughs> that that's when you met my parents. I met your parents, yeah. And your mom, of course, did the requisite... Here's a picture of your to be husband or whatever he was a baby. <laughs> naked on the carpet. You know? I think he was in a tub, but yeah. <laughs> um, and and um, what is your impression of me as an adult? What kind of person? Um, very insightful. Oh, thank you. Very very conscious of what's going on around you. Um, you also, and, and for this I am, I will always be very, very grateful. You also took incredibly good care of your mother. You're going to make me cry. Thank Sorry. you. She passed just this past July, yeah. um, at 94 years old. Um, but she was a great lady. I see so much of her in you. I do too. Now that I'm all older. the good things, all the good things. Well, some of the not so good things, but yeah. but but you really took responsibility uh, for your mother in a way that I could not take for my mother because I lived two thousand miles away from her. Right. So I was fortunate to have an older brother who played that role in Chicago. But um, you know, you're smart and you're funny and immensely caring and and those are those are traits that I always value well, so. thank you it makes me feel really good good also makes me feel a little um teary yeah um you've lost your mother you've lost your father 
you lost two, two of your brothers. brothers. Yep. Yeah, that was difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And yet somehow I managed to get through it. You do. I do. And I think that, um, you know, when your mom passes, it's a really different situation than if you, when you lose other people in your family. That's There's right. nothing like losing your mom. That's exactly right. And the thing that I get comforted by and still is as long as I tell stories about her and share memories about her, she's always, she's always with me. Yes. And so I miss her, but I don't miss her because I feel like she's always with me. Well, also the last few years were very, very challenging for her. They were. She had significant dementia. Yep. Um, and so, so the mother that we knew had really disappeared yeah. in many ways. She still had her good days. She did. And, and I think that, you know, me being a caring person and kind and, and always thinking about others, that came from my mother for sure. She, we always had extra people on holidays. She always had somebody extra living with her, in, yes. including one of my nephews and, of course, me. Um, so I think she was a, a really good influence on me. And she's accepting of everyone. Yes, she was. I, I never, well, maybe not in my dad's life, but for my mom, I never met her, or I never saw her meet anybody that she wasn't inclusive with. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter to her, and, and she didn't grow up that way. So no. I'm not sure how no, she got that, she but, did not. but she got it. She so definitely did. She I, definitely you know, I learned did. that through her, and I think that helped me get through my years in school, for sure, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of things in life, you know, after the fact. I will never forget when Gino called them to say that he was becoming Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that went over big. <laughs> um I don't we know. We were not Jewish. Uh, no. <laughs> we were Protestant. I don't know what your dad said, mm. but your mom's response was, oh, well, it's the same God. <laughs> and that oh was gosh. classic Peggy. I love that. That was classic of her. I think that's so and true. And clearly that has come through to you. It has. Thank you. I think in many ways more than, more than your brothers. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so I don't have anything else. No, I don't ask. think I, I, I don't think I do either. Um, this has been an amazing experience. Hasn't it though? It was interesting. Made me think about a time that was way in the past and sort of how that shaped me and, and everything that I went through and hearing that other people's experience were the same as mine. Um, that was like validation, like you remembered it right. That is what happened, and it was not pleasant. But I think that, that what's especially um, compelling about this kind of interaction is that we all are the product of our experiences. That's true. And yet, how often do we think back to those experiences to try to track this happened, consequently, I am this way. Right. And I think I think this was a formative experience for you. Oh, absolutely. And cathartic in a way. Um, you know, sharing things that I probably haven't shared with anybody except maybe the people that went through it like I yeah. did. Yeah. Overall. Even though I was nervous in the beginning. <laughs> I don't feel nervous you now. You don't feel nervous now? No. Sure. Um, I know that there's a lot of pain in that book. You went through a lot of really pain before you published it. And I think that that is true. But you did say that it brought you a little bit more empathy for other cultures. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even though I, at the time, of course, I didn't think so. Um, in, in retrospect, I, I think it was. I, I definitely think they could have made a different plan. Um, and, and like I said, I don't know what that would look like other than making the schools equal in the first place. And the, uh, the, the recording boxes last week, earlier this week, it's all blending together. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of kids thought they were put on the front lines for this. Yes, uh, yes. Voice, the, they didn't. The voice stood up as a father. Do you feel like that was you? And then it was reflected in the book that way? 
I think so. I think that they just said, well, let's try this. But they didn't think about how it was going to affect us. I don't think they even realized how it was going to affect, affect all of us, um, including teachers and ad administration and, and parents. Um, I just don't think they thought it through. Yeah, it's been 50 years. <laughs> yes. A lot of these things have not been solved. Nope. So I think we have to vote the people in that are going to do the things that we want that they should do to protect our kids and make sure they do get an ex education, an equal education that's fair for everybody in a public school. And the trends, of course, are all in the opposite direction right now. Yes, they are. Well, a lot of times teachers spend their own money. That's one of the things that happens. Having been a teacher, I know that they spend extra time. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I would add that parents have an important role to play in this as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, tiny, tiny little experience. Uh, when we moved here to Seattle, both our boys were fairly young, and when our oldest started public school, he was the only Jewish kid in school. Oh my gosh. And my husband and I met with each of his teachers every year in those formative first grade through fourth grade, asking, what do you do at Christmas time? What do you do at Easter time? Oh, because yeah. we wanted to make sure that Gabe would never be put in a position where he had to somehow defend who he was. And 201, every single teacher was open and interested and invited us to come in and tell stories. Wow. One time I came in and made latkes. <laughs> but, but that, I think, is also as a result of what happened you know, 15 years earlier right. in Seattle when something that was well-intentioned was a failure because it wasn't thought through. Yeah. I think we need to appreciate our teachers more. Oh, yes. I think they need to get paid more because they're not just a teacher. They're a social worker. They're a nurse. They're a parent. Um, you know, they do all of those things. Um, I think that you have to... You have to give, give the kids the opportunity to be successful. And they need to be supported in learning about people yes. from different cultures. And that they need to be taught about that when they're in school. Yes. Um, because it, it, it would make things a whole lot easier for everybody. Um, I don't know that the schools in Seattle will be truly, ever truly integrated. Um, nope. But I do know that there are people that are trying to make that happen. Yes. And that we just need to gather those people around us and make sure that the kids get everything that they deserve. And the parents, too. Yes. For sure. Excellent. Thank you, Marie. Thank, Thank you for inviting <laughs> me to do this with you. Thank you for doing this with me. It was fun. It was.